Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Bill's lesson today is in Luke chapter 9, entitled The Prideful Look, Part 3. Luke chapter 9 is where we are. Working our way through the book of Luke, and we're kind of hung up in one spot, dealing with this whole issue of pride we've been looking at here in Luke chapter 9. And uh, we're going to be down in verse 46. And it arose from a, a certain circumstance, of course, where they're, they're having problems with, uh, well, having problems listening. Jesus, just in the previous uh, uh, ver- two verses before, tells them that he's going to be dying. I'm going to be given over into the hands of men. It's a pronouncement of his death. And so a verse and a half later, the, well, the next verse, it says the disciples didn't understand what he said. So I've got first graders in my Sunday school class here that understand Jesus died for our sins. That these guys, these are the apostles for crying out loud. Why, why can't they hear him? And so it, it's, it's amazing on the one hand, why can't they understand? And they immediately jump off and notice verse 46, and an argument arose ab- among them, which of them was the greatest. Really? So he just said that he's going to be dying to pay for our sins, and you're off on who's the greatest. What, what's the problem here? I can tell you what the problem is. The problem is a thing called pride. This is what it does to you. It makes you incapable of hearing. It makes you inca- of the most fundamental and essential teachings of God. You can't hear it if you're walking in pride. It's the perfect example of that. So straight after Jesus just said, let these words sink into your ears. I will be delivered over into the hands of men. Straight after that, they go right back into conversation how awesome they are. Or who's the awesomeness, I should say. Verse 46, an argument arose among them as to which of them might be the greatest. But Jesus, knowing what was, they were thinking, he doesn't overhear it. He just knows these are, arrogant, these are arrogant dudes. Because why? Because they're breathing. Because that's where humans are. Knowing what they were thinking in their hearts, took a child stood him by his side and said, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. You can't get better than that. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. And for he who is least among you, this one is the one who is the greatest. And so such a great lesson about pride and about arrogance and about what it does to us. So we've been looking at that for a while. And we saw last time mankind's fall came from uh, from glory, came as a result of us thinking we could have God status. There's Adam and Eve. Here's where we fell. Here's where everything went. Sorry, there we go. Something, something quit there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. For God knows, here's Satan's lie. It's a total lie, every bit of it. That in the day that you eat of this fruit, eat of the fruit, your eyes will be opened. Their eyes weren't opened up until this point? No, it most definitely was open. But, but your eyes somehow are going to be opened differently than they are already? No, of course not. You will be like God. Oh, there's the tasty part of the fruit. I get to have God status. Whatever I say becomes real. I can create stuff out of thin air. Everybody bows down to me. I'm awesome. I get to have, you know, this whole God status uh, 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 temptation was the strongest of all of them. And, of course, that's where pride comes in. We place replace God in our lives with ourselves. God, there's only one throne in your life, and either you're sitting on it or God is. It's either your agenda you're following today or you're following God's agenda. Which is it? We know who God, who's the God. You can't have but one. Jesus says you can't serve both God. You can't serve two gods. So which is it? It's either yourself or it's God. So here's, I found this interesting. I'm not sure who made this quote, but I think it's good. One of the biggest differences between you and God is that God never thinks he's you. <laughs> never does. He's just not that crazy, but you're crazy enough to think you're God. Uh, we're all tempted that way for sure. Uh, Matthew 18.3 shows us our status is definitely not, not God-like. Our status is that of a child. Truly, I tell you, Jesus is speaking. Notice how serious this is. This is it's not just an option for us. Here's one of the options to make your life better. No, this is, this is it. Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty heavy, guys. That's like all eternity. So if I don't go to the kingdom of heaven, where do I go? Option two is a really hot place. So this is serious. This isn't just some option. You know, know, yeah, I should accept. And and notice, he's not telling us, we saw last time, he's not telling you to act like a child. We don't need any more of that, okay, please. Or have an attitude of a child. No, he's asking you to take the status of a child. And what is the status of a child? Silch! They bring nothing to the table. They have nothing. Children don't have any degrees. They don't earn any income. They have nothing to offer. 
They don't, as some people say, they don't make your house better. A couple say, you know, we were married, we think we're going to have a child to improve our relationship. Don't do it! <laughs> it won't improve your relationship. You better have a good relationship before you bring a child into it. Or that child will wreck your whole home. Promise. You, you gave birth to a sinner. You're going to add a third sinner to the trio there. I mean, come on. It's not going to make it better. The status of a child is that a child actually brings nothing to the table. And by the way, that's okay, because that's what it means to be a kid. None of us were born with degrees or incomes or influence. None of us brought anything to the table as a child. That's not the reason why our parents had us. They had us because they had stability, they had love, and they wanted to bring someone into that same circumstance to grow them up to become like them. And that's awesome. That's the, way, the reason why we have children, not the other way around. Children are not assets. They are liabilities. And like I said, that's okay. So why do we love them? Because they're our kids, that's why. And here's the message. Why does God love you? Because you're his kids, and for no other reason you bring nothing to the table. You are not an asset. Heaven's not better. It was already perfect. Pulling you in does not make it perfecter. That was a word. God was already complete for all eternity, adding you to his life. He wasn't incomplete without you. Your mom and dad were fine. They were great before they brought you. They didn't need you. They brought you in because they wanted someone to share their love with, and that's the only, reason why, only true reason to bring a child into the world. Ch children aren't supposed to have anything to offer. That's the parent's job. That's what God is saying. Accept your status. If you can accept your status as someone who brings nothing to God's table and that God has everything to give you and you have nothing to give him, then the kingdom of heaven is yours. How incredibly important this teaching is. We have nothing to offer him at all. Heaven isn't better because we're there. Take the status of a child, hear me, so that God can take his status as father in your life. Don't you want him to be father? You've got to be a kid first. So I want to be accepted on my own merit, and I want to be accepted for my great, the, the things that I bring to the table. Well, you can stay with that, but God's not going to be your father. You need him to be, but you're not letting him be because you won't stay, take your spot. You've got to take your spot for him to take his spot. And we've been harping on this whole issue of the horrors of pride, and we're going to do a little shift here today at least. We're going to be looking more at humility. What is... So, so we don't need pride in our lives. Pride is terrible. Pride wrecks us. It destroys our homes. It destroys our families. It destroys our culture. It destroys our world. It is currently. It has always done this. But, but what's the alternative? So I don't have pride. What do I do? Well, I need to learn what humility is. And so we're going to be spending some time here looking what humility is. So just simply ask, answering the question, what is humility? What is humility? Humility is reality. That's what it is. Humility is sobriety. You're not humble. You're not sober. You're drunk on something. You're hopped up on something. Arrogance is, pride is very intoxicating. Uh, status of God. Y you're, you're a lunatic if you think that. You might as well be doped up. You might as well be drunk. You're, you're so far, you're so delusioned. What, uh, chemicals can't, can't get you any further than where you are right now. Talk about a natural high. Yeah, that's what you are if you think you're God. That's what pride does. That's what it is. You're deluded. Humility is reality. Humility is living with the truth of ourselves. Here's, here's Paul's recommendation, Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought to. What is your status? Children. But rather think of yourself with sober judgment. So if I'm not sober, what am I? Yeah, you see, I'm, I'm not... Yeah, I'm not just throwing words out there. I'm saying to you, either you're either living in humility or you're not sober. You're not, you don't need chemicals to get there. You're, the chemicals your brain's creating, the endorphins you're coming up with because you're of a godlike status, is putting you in a place where you lack sobriety. You, you've you've, you've got to have this stability. You've got to have this place. Humility is stability. It is reality. It, it, is, it is leaving a deluded state and coming to a state of sobriety. It's what it is. It's, it's, it's admitting uh, that you aren't God and that your status forever is that of a child uh, and that it's not about you, that you have needs and that you're dependent upon God for everything and in every way. This is soberness. This is humility. That is the way it works. Romans 
12, 3, you see it on the board there. You're familiar with uh, Martin Luther? I'm not talking about Martin Luther King. I'm talking about the original Martin Luther. You know that guy? He started the church called the Lutheran Church back in the 1500s. He was not a Lutheran. Martin Luther was actually Catholic. In fact, he was a Catholic priest, had a doctorate degree from Catholic seminary. But he began to read the Bible, began to compare it to what actually the doctrines, the, the, I shouldn't say the doctrines, but more, more than anything, the practices of the Catholic Church in the 1500s compared to what the Bible said. And he wrote up what, what, was, what came to be called the 99 Thesis. These 99 Theses were complaints that he had and, and, and atrocities that he saw being committed by the church, among not the least of which was they were teaching a different doctrine than what Jesus taught. He nailed these, these 99 Theses on, in his, on his local church door, Wittenberg Church, Germany. I think it was called Saxony at that time, but anyway, you know where it is. Over there in Wittenberg, you got in big trouble because you didn't cross the Catholic Church back then. They would kill you. They killed a lot of people. And they went right about doing that with Martin Luther, but because of the princes of Germany, they were he was protected. And so in, because they couldn't get to him physically, they got to him, tried to get to him spiritually. And so in a papal bull, which was basically a pope saying stuff that he claimed was correct, which of course was not in this case, 1521, the pope excommunicated Martin Luther, which no shock to anybody because you didn't mess with the Catholic Church. They would excommunicate you. They did. Because he tried desperately, like I said, to reform the Catholic Church, he didn't want to become anything other than a Catholic. He was not against Catholic. He was the Bible. You know, it's the church. Catholic just simply means the universal church. He was all about the universal church. He just wanted there to be reform. In that bull, he expected to be excommunicated. But in that bull, the, the, the pope referred to his followers. Of course, his name was Luther, right? They referred to his followers for the first time as this Lutherans. And he didn't have a problem being excommunicated, but he had a huge issue with his followers being called Lutherans. Here's, here's his own quote. He, he writes this to his followers as soon as he hears the papal bull. He says this, Please do not use my name. Do not call yourselves Lutherans, but Christians. Why should I, a miserable bag of worms, give my meaningless name to Christ's children? He's 100% right. I'm not calling him a bag of worms. But he's 100% right in being humble about the whole thing. A typical person would say, yeah, man, they're my followers because I want to carry my, my name is so important. No, my meaningless name. He understood he's just a child serving God and by God's grace is, is still alive. And because he understands, as you and I need to understand, humility is reality. It's who we really are. We bring nothing to the table. Humility, number one, is reality. Humility, number two, is dependency. Dependency. What does it mean to be dependent upon something? Do you know? If I say you have a substance dependency, what does that mean? It, we understand that, right? Addiction to some alcohol, some kind of drugs. Um, I have a problem with uh, caffeine. I can just sit down and drink a whole pot of it. I don't know. I've got to stop. It's not good for me. I've been reading uh, recently uh, lots of books, and one of the books I've found very interesting and actually have grown to love is the AA book. Anybody ever read the AA book, the Alcoholics Anonymous book? Uh, it's a good book. Highly recommend it. I don't necessarily agree with all that's in it, but I'm not an alcoholic or drug addict either. I don't have, just for everybody's information here, I'm a teetotaler if you want to know. I don't ever have and won't be doing any of that stuff. One, because life's too short. Two, because ministry's too important. And three, because your Baptist ministers, I don't know, drinking alcohol out in public somewhere. I mean, what does that look like? I, I mean, and I got people in my church who struggle with alcohol and, and drugs. I mean, why would I do that? It doesn't make sense. So anyway, all, for all those reasons, I'm not those things. But, but I, I started reading this book just because it's made such a difference in so many people's lives, people, members of our church, and family members and people that I love, and has been a, 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 been a jumping off place from from an addiction to a place of trusting Christ as personal Savior for a number of people that I've known. And so, so, wow, I wanted to read this book. The thing that impressed me about this book, and just to sum it up very quickly for you, was that it over and over teaches the fact that, that an alcoholic or a drug addict cannot make it without total dependence upon God. That's the whole emphasis. The whole emphasis of the book is about humility. It says if, because, because of our arrogance and attitude, because we think we can make it, and because of the reality of the fact that we can't, the way we offset that is, is we, we anesthetize ourselves, either through drugs or alcohol or whatever. Makes sense. I understand that. I mean, I, you know, but he says the, the premise of the book basically is you have to humble yourself and say, I can't do anything apart from God's help. That's, that's, the, that's the bottom line of the whole book. I highly recommend it. It's got great testimonies in there. 
But, but I, I was reading that thinking, you know, of course, I'm a Baptist minister and I don't drink and take drugs, you know, alcohol or anything like that. But am I different than these people? I can't put one foot in front of another without God either. My issue is not alcohol and drugs, but I have a whole other set of issues. I happen to be addicted to sin, as it seems. It's so every day, apart from the intervention of God in my life and my dependence upon Him, I'm a sinner. So, so understand, humility is dependency. So I'm either dependent on something that anesthetizes me, takes me out of sobriety, or I'm dependent upon God. That's going to take humility for me. So instead, instead of believing the lie, you're going to be like God, start every day by acknowledging our dependence upon Him. How about that? Our, our need for Him, our confidence in Him, that's humility. Here we, We've heard from a Lutheran, now let's hear from a Baptist. Here we go. F.B. Meyer, one of the famous, famous Baptist preachers, says, I used to think that God's gifts were on shelves, one above another. And the taller we grow, the easier we can reach them. He says, no, I find... God's gifts are on shelves, one beneath another. And the lower we stoop, the more we get. So true. So true. The, the gifts of God, the blessings of God, are not when we exalt ourselves. They're when, our, when we humble ourselves. Humility is reality. Humility is dependency. Humility is a conviction of sin. Are you convinced that you're a sinner? Saved by the grace of God. A conviction, that's all there is. Thank you, sir. Luke chapter 18, verse 13. Notice the, the position. We've been looking at this so with pride here. Luke 13, 18, verse 13. The tax collector stood at a distance and would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is the attitude. This is the attitude of humility. We never get above that. It's from this position that, 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 that not only forgiveness comes, but we walk with God in constant humility. Notice the, the recommendations of Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. This is, of course, we call them the Beatitudes. This is the, in other words, be attitudes. This is the way to be. I want to be right. Well, here's how you be right. Blessed are the poor in spirit, never the strong in spirit. I don't know about you. My, my goal is always to be strong in spirit. But that's, that's not what God has called me to do. Poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wow, I want heaven, don't you? Blessed are those who mourn. Anybody ever mourned here? Ever had your heart broken because you've lost someone you loved? How vulnerable does that make you feel? So vulnerable. You're, you're just, your life has come crashing in because someone who your heart was tied to has gone away. And now, what do you do with that? You're, you're vulnerable. You're, notice Jesus' recommendations, though. That you're poor in spirit, that you're vulnerable, that you're in the next one. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So if you're not meek, I guess you won't, right? You got it. You got it. Notice the position he's asking. It's the humility is the conviction of who we are, that we're nothing without God. It's taking the status. The word here for uh, poor in spirit actually in the Greek refers to a beggar that's just squatted down by the side of the road, holding out his hand with his head down like this. And in fact, literally the picture is that of a cringing beggar. Blessed are the cringing beggars. Anybody want to be a cringing beggar? Cringing beggar, to what it means to be, what it means to be, it's not just a matter of poor. You say, well, I was poor. Yeah, me too. But we used to be poor. We were raised poor. Well, that's not what he's talking about. But you ate every day, right? You didn't stand on the side of the road asking for a handout. A cringing beggar is a person who doesn't have anything else. He doesn't have a goat. He doesn't have a chicken. He doesn't have a shred of cro extra clothes to put on. He doesn't have a house to go to. He doesn't have water to drink. He doesn't have shelter over his head. doesn't have anything. A cringing beggar is someone who, unless someone, whatever comes into it, he's totally dependent upon what gets in that hand as he holds it out. So when Jesus says, poor in spirit, understand how poor he's talking about. Blessed are those. Why? Because until you take the status of a cringing beggar, God cannot be the supplier that he wants to be for you. The status of a child, God cannot be the father that he wants to be to you. Take your status. It's soberness. It's, it's, it's leaving delusion. Measure your humility. Here's, here's a recommendation. By, the sense, by your sense of unworthiness of God's forgiveness and grace. Sometimes we find ourselves thinking, you know, yeah, heaven's going to be a better place because I'm there. You never say that, but you have that attitude. 
how, 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 how great is your sense of unworthiness of the forgiveness and grace of God? It's a measure of your humility. Measure your humility, here's the second recommendation, by your willingness to forgive others. Preacher, I wish you hadn't said that. I gotta say it, I'm sorry, we got time. Still got time. Because we think, we, I say, well, no, I understand that I need God's forgiveness and grace, but have you understood it enough that you're supposed to be the dispenser of those same things? Because until you do, you're not humble. Hear me. Because here's what I'm saying when I don't forgive you for the things that you've done. I'm saying that somehow I'm, I would never do what he did. That's why I can't forgive. I would, I would never have treated me the way she did, and so I'm going to make her pay for it. You would have never, right? So you're... So you're better than them? No. There's a humility problem there. Measure your humility by your willingness to forgive others. Humility is the conviction of sin. Here's the a, here's a fourth thing. Humility is ceasing to think about yourself. Ceasing. To, that's a hard one. Just cease to think about me. I've done that my whole... I'm a professional at that. High, high self-esteemers... Constantly thinking of themselves, how awesome I am, how great I am, the gift to the world, the gift to women, the gift to men, the gift to heaven. I'm the gift to everything because I'm so awesome. That's the way we train our society and our kids. I, we just believe we're everything. High self-esteem. Think nothing of themselves. Low self-esteem. Think nothing of themselves. Constantly, they're just thinking nothing about except themselves. How bad they are, how they don't measure up, how they're worthless, how they wish they were better, how they're constantly self-focused. So a high self-esteem or a low self-esteem is constantly focused on themselves. Humility is neither one of those things. Humility is ceasing to think about yourself altogether. Just stop it. Here, I'm going to wave a wand, and you're all going to stop. Boom, there you go. Easy said, right? Hard to do. Stop thinking about yourselves. Humility is the ceasing to self-focus 100%. Notice Philippians, the recommendation of Paul, chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit. Have you ever been, have you ever had a pure motive? It's tough. It's tough. It, it, it is. There's always some of us in it, right? It's hard, so hard for us not to think of ourselves. Rather, here's the directive. You know, it's not just a matter of stopping thinking about myself. It's directing my thoughts towards someone else. In humility, value others above yourselves. Please do that. Our culture is crashing because people don't do that. Our churches, our families are, are wrecked because it's all about me, and I'm going to give my part, but unless you give your part... And it's going to be on my standards because I'm the one that decides because I guess, you know, I have a status of God and you're not acknowledging that, uh, apparently. Jo join the movement, though. Somebody said, you know, stop thinking of yourself. Why? Because no one else is. No one else is. We're, my wife was reading uh, or listening to something and this guy said something I thought was, and she also thought was very good. So when we're 18, we're so worried about what other people think. Oh, what do they think? My hair, my clothes, my car, my this, my that. All right. When we get to be 40, yeah, we stop worrying so much about what people think. When we get to be 60, we realize nobody was thinking about us anyway. The whole time. They were all focused on themselves the whole time. And so were we. We were all just introspective, self-focused. The world will be changed by people who would stop thinking about themselves and start thinking about others. Others, folks, humility is ceasing to think about yourself. Measure your humility by your willingness for others to receive the prominence and credit while you're forgotten. It's a measure of humility. It's a good measure. Humility is ceasing to think of ourselves. Humility, ultimately, bottom line, is being like God. So have you ever thought the question, is God prideful or is he humble? Ooh, I think that's a very good question. That's a, that's a searching question. It's an easily answered question because Jesus answered it for us. Jesus is none other than God, and he sets the example for us. Notice, in your relationships with one another, had the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This is exactly the way he thought. And he didn't just think this way, he acted this way. Who? Jesus 
being in the very nature, the same as God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantages. He had nothing to prove and didn't try to. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, humbled himself, it goes on to say, even to death on a cross. Wow. This is who Jesus is. Jesus was God telling us in person who he is, who he is God. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is who Jesus is. Nothing to prove. He had no pride. He had no self-esteem. He, he didn't. He didn't low or high. He just simply didn't think about himself whatsoever. Nothing to prove. Thought nothing of himself. Thought only of us. Be like Jesus. Be like him. You want to make a difference in your world? Probably never heard that before. Be like Jesus. Jesus was not self-focused. Had he been self-focused, he wouldn't have come to save this miserable pastor and this miserable group of people. He wouldn't have. No way. He was us-focused. I mean, what, what, so Jesus was God in the flesh telling us who he is. So what did Jesus tell us about himself? Some of the titles that he took among them was the Lamb of God. A lamb. Anybody here ever been attacked by a ravenous lamb? I mean, they're just like prowling the countryside. Never know these things. They're, they have so many skills and so many deadly abilities. Now, a sheep is one of the most humble animals in the world for a good reason. They've got nothing going on between their ears. And a lamb is a baby sheep. So Jesus takes the title, hear me, of a baby sheep? You want to be like Jesus? That's humble. So, and get this, at, at his baptism, where John the Baptist calls in the Lamb of God, the, the Holy Spirit descends in the form of what? A dove. Have you ever been attacked by a dove? You ever, you know, scared to go outside because of the doves? The dove's dad. No. It's a symbol of peace for all the right reasons. We got all kinds of birds around here that'll get you. I was out uh, at a wedding and I was watching these guys grill out and they were putting some sausages and some steaks on a grill. And then if you're from here, he made a very big mistake. He turned his back <laughs> on the grill. If you're not from here or not here very long, you'll know that whatever's on that grill will not stay there very long because we have these things called sky rats, also called seagulls. And they will grab a whole steak off a flaming grill and carry it out into the Gulf of Mexico. I'm telling you. They're terrible. Doves don't do that. Doves aren't stealing your stuff. Doves aren't wrecking, I don't know, your, your yard. They're not tearing up your cars. They're not out there catching little bunnies and eating them. There are birds that do stuff like that, but not doves. So, so God pictures himself in two forms, one as a lamb and the other as a dove. Are you getting what he's communicating to us? Are you getting that? He could have pictured himself in any way. He could have done anything he wanted to. He's absolutely sovereign, completely, he's completely God in every way, 100% God in every way. He could have been born anywhere, at any time, to anyone. But he was born to two poverty-stricken individuals who, who, who had nowhere to go, Born in a stable in a tiny town south of Jerusalem, no name town. Laid in a manger because there was nowhere else for them to put him other than the uh, floors that were not necessarily clean, to be sure. He is God, and yet that is what he chose to do. Are you getting the message? Are you getting it? He's God, and he could have grown up anywhere. He could have done anything. Instead, he was chose to be the son of a manual labor and live in a town that was on the way to nothing and coming from nothing and meant nothing to the people of that day, Nazareth. What good can come out of Nazareth, the Scripture says. That, that was the way they felt. It's a tiny little town that had nothing. had no, no power brokers came from there. Of course, Jesus did. He could have done it any way. He could have done anywhere. He has total choice. He's totally sovereign. And yet that's what he chose to be. You get the message? He, he, could have, he could have lived anywhere. He could have done anything that he wanted. In the three years of his ministry, he could have fought. He could have stayed in, I don't know, he could have been born any other time. He could have stayed in Hilton's. He could have had major tours. He could have met rallies in large uh, communities and charged tremendous dollars. He could have gotten all that because unlike all the guys that seem to do that anymore and claim to heal, Jesus actually did do that. He did heal people. He did deliver. 100%. But what did he do? So a disciple comes to him and somewhere along the line of his ministry and says, follow, uh, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you want to go. He says, 
I, I read this, this is me reading between the lines. He says, you do understand that the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, I'm not sure what you think you're getting out of this contract of me following Jesus. We're not headed to the Hilton when this is over. We're not going out on my yacht, I don't know, in the Sea of Galilee or something like that. I don't know what you're thinking. It's coming from this. But I'm going to be laying my head on a rock tonight out in the wilderness. Now, that's awesome that you want to follow me, but you understand the consequences. I hope your motives are pure. Because there's nothing, you're not getting anything out of this. Jesus could have done it any way, but he does it that way? Wow. And of course, the ultimate example of what Jesus really could have done. So he's the God of all heaven, owns all things, is the possessor and the controller of all things. And yet, when he dies, they divided up all that he had. It turned out to be only the clothes on his back. In fact, there was one garment they wouldn't split because it was more valuable if you didn't split it. And they threw dice for that. So they completely took all of his garments and hung him on the cross completely naked. He could have done it anyway, guys, that he wanted to. could have died anyway. He, he had total, total choice. And yet that's the way he did it. I don't know when you were, the last time you were publicly naked, but I bet you didn't wind up being, feeling better about yourself. I bet you were really humbled. Hopefully never. Jesus was publicly naked for us. Are, are you getting the message? No pride in him. No self-esteem. He didn't esteem himself. He esteemed us. He loved us. And he came to show us an example of how really to live. And the live is not focused on yourself. The, 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 the way to live is in humility. Humility is being like God. That is exactly the way God is. God has got nothing to prove. He doesn't go out of his way to show us how powerful he is. He's not thundering from heaven, you know, all around us. He's coming to us and touching us in our hearts in a humble way, coming to us as a lamb, as a dove. Why? Because that's who he really is. That's who we need to follow. Be like Jesus. The world desperately needs a lot of little Jesuses. Not one more of you. Not one more of me. I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we think about what God has said to us this morning. God, we're so grateful for the example you came, the picture you gave us of your son coming and pleading with us to come out of our deluded state to a state of sobriety, a state of humility, where we understand how unworthy we are of your mercy and grace. We accept our status as a cringing beggar, as a, as a little child, so that you can assume your status as our provider, our father. God, we thank you for this. We pray that, that you would help these teachings to ring home in us, bring to, bring to mind right now the ways that we can learn to forget about ourselves and focus on others. Thank you so much, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.